Term limits pushed Missouri's last Democratic governor out of office in 2016. Now, with incumbent Republican Mike Parson facing term limits of his own and ballot questions asking voters to legalize abortion, sports betting, and guarantee paid leave, two Democrats see an opening to flip the governor's office from red back to blue. House Minority Leader Crystal Quaid and businessman Mike Hamra debate on a special episode of The Record. Welcome to the 2024 Democratic primary debate in the race for governor. I'm Mark Maxwell. And I'm Ruth Ezel. House Minority uh, Leader Crystal, Crystal Quaid and businessman Mike Hammer are running for the Democratic nomination in the race for governor. Now each candidate will have 60 seconds to answer specific questions. At the moderator's discretion, we may offer 30 seconds for a rebuttal or a clarification. Both candidates have agreed to these rules. They'll each get a one minute uh, closing statement at the end. We determined who would go first with a coin toss. First, we begin with Ms. Quaid. Both of you have promised to restore abortion rights, but voters could do much of that heavy lifting at the ballot box this November. If the constitutional amendment is approved, it might open a flood of lawsuits or legislative fights trying to determine which old laws or new laws would conflict with that amended constitution. So what additional steps would you take as governor to protect abortion access? Well, first I want to say, Ruth and Mark, thank you so much for having us and Mike for being here. Um, you know, as the only mom and woman in this race, I understand firsthand what it means to have politicians in our doctor's offices. I'm really proud and honored to have the endorsement of Planned Parenthood and the above other abortion rights groups here in our state uh, because they know that I've been leading the fight in this conversation. I was in Jefferson City when the Republicans passed the most restrictive abortion ban in the entire country without exceptions for rape or incest and very limited life of the mother provisions. And so I deeply understand how important this is for folks and I am so so excited that we're going to have the opportunity in November to take those take the rights back that we absolutely need to have in our state. What I will say to ensure is make sure that as governor that the legislature will listen to the voices of Missourians and that what happens on election day will be upheld. Mr. Hammer, would you like to respond? Sure. No, I want to thank you too. Uh, thank you, Representative Quaid, uh, for the opportunity here uh, today to debate. But uh, I also believe that it's time that we restore women's right to abortion in the state. Luckily, advocates across the state have uh, put the uh, initiative on the ballot in November and voters will have the opportunity to restore women's rights to abortion in the state of Missouri. But as governor, uh, I will do everything I can to ensure that we protect those rights and that we continue to do that both with legislative efforts as well as any other efforts uh, that we can avail ourselves of uh, as governor. Now, Mr. Hammer, you're running an ad. It describes what you won't do, that you won't take away Missourians' rights for their freedoms. Now, some voters just might interpret that to mean you're not going to take away their right to own whatever type of gun they want or to carry firearms wherever they want. So what limits or regulations, if any, would you put on the sale, the possession, or carrying of guns? Well, look, I think it's evident that the majority of Missourians in the state of Missouri, including gun owners like myself, see the need for uh, stronger background checks as well as red flag laws. Uh, even law enforcement agents want, strong, want red flag laws in the state of Missouri because they walk into situations all the time unprepared, not knowing what they're walking into. Red flag laws would make a real difference for our law enforcement, but it would also increase the safety of people walking around on the street every day. Ms. Quaid, do you have a response? Yeah, you know, as my time as a Democratic leader in Jefferson City, I have spent a, a lot of time with law enforcement officials from all over the state. And the thing that I hear the most from them is not only do they need additional staffing and, of course, salaries and training, um, but they hear a lot about particularly juveniles having access to guns. I am a huge proponent for local control around these conversations. Look, I grew up in rural southwest Missouri. I understand when a, a teenager sometimes needs to have access to a gun to protect their livestock. That is very different than having a kid walking down the street having a firearm in a big city. Now, Ms. Quaid, Missouri's income tax bracket, it's technically a graduated one, but everybody who works a full-time job, or if they make $8,449, they will pay just under 5% in state income taxes. So in these times when you have companies reporting record profits while their workers watch the value of their dollar diminish because of inflation, would you seek to adjust rates or brackets to make the state's income tax less regressive? 
Yeah, I think that we absolutely need to have a conversation around what fair taxes look like in our state. Listen, every year I've seen in Jefferson City the Republicans give tax breaks to the wealthiest and to our corporations instead of having conversations around things that impact folks' day-to-day -day lives. I've sponsored legislation addressing child care tax credits and elder care tax credits. We've even had conversations around food taxes. And so absolutely I think we need to make adjustments, but we need to make adjustments for everyday working class Missourians. We're going to move on here. Mr. Hammer, the Missouri Constitution prohibits the use of public aid for religious purposes and institutions, including any funding to sustain private or public schools controlled by any religious creed. That's from the Constitution. Do you think the expanded tax breaks for donors to the private school tax credit program are constitutional, and would you overturn them? Well, look, here's the truth of the matter. We aren't supporting our public school systems the way we need to be supporting our public school systems in the state of Missouri. I just relieved a policy plan, 42-page policy plan, uh, yesterday that details out some of the ideas and uh, initiatives that I'll take on as governor in bringing back funding for public schools here in the state of Missouri. There is no reason why the kids in the state of Missouri shouldn't have a great public school education. And as governor, I'll do everything I can to continue to support that. Representative Quaid, would you like to respond? Yeah, you know, as the endorsed candidate from our educators across the state, um, they, they know that I have been fighting for public education for a very long time. I voted against the expansion to take your public tax dollars and move it to private and religious institutions. I absolutely will never support that. We have so much work to do in our public education space. We have some of the lowest paid teachers in the entire country, and we have so much work to do, and absolutely I would not support public taxpayers' dollars going to private institutions. The Democratic primary debate continues just after this. Welcome back to the 2024 Democratic primary debate in the race for governor. Ms. Quaid, the American education experience is driven largely by socioeconomics. School funding is tied to property values and not to the value that we might place on any given individual student. What changes would you make to Missouri's education funding formula to make sure students in urban and rural schools get a quality education? Yeah, I appreciate that question, Ruth. You know, I am the very first in my family to graduate high school. And so I deeply understand how important our public school systems are for every child, regardless of where they live. And my record shows that I have worked tirelessly in Jefferson City to try to ensure that every kiddo has access. Um, when it comes to things that we need to do the, for the foundation formula, first and foremost is increased funding across the board. Folks may not know that there were changes made to that f foundation formula several years ago that allow the Republicans to say, we're fully funding our schools when and we absolutely have not been. We need to increase transportation costs and we need to move towards making sure that our kiddos who are enrolled, and that is how our schools are getting their funding, not just based on attendance. And so I look forward to being able to do that work as governor. Do you have a response, Mr. Hammer? So for the last 22 years, uh, I've built an organization by investing back in people versus focusing on profit above all else. And one of the things that I'm proud that we've done as an organization is supporting people who want to go back to school to get some form of education. We reimburse our employees' tuition if they want to go back to school. In addition to that, we support our high school and college age employees to do their homework in our stores. We pay them to do that, and then we compensate them for good grades. I'm a huge advocate for making sure we do everything we can to lean in to support the kids in the state of Missouri to get a great public education. Mr. Hammer, a 2022 survey found that 65% of Missouri adults earning less than $50,000 a year skipped medical care. 39% of them rationed medicine. What specific steps would you take to lower the cost of health care and health insurance for Missouri workers? Well, I appreciate the question because in the plan that I just released yesterday, we talked specifically about how we're going to support health care in the state of Missouri. One thing we can do is go after lowering insurance costs. Uh, the other opportunity that we're going to have is providing a prescription drug opportunity. So many states have put in place a board, a prescription drug board, that actually lowers the cost of prescription drugs in the state. As governor, I will go to work immediately on putting in place a prescription drug board that will work on lowering prescription drugs uh, here in the state, as well as helping people that are burdened with medical debt in the state of Missouri, which I know there are many people that are burdened with medical debt right now. Representative Quaid, would you do any, what would you do in this instance? Yeah, I appreciate this question. You know, 
over, as I've been traveling the state, the thing that I hear the most from folks is the fact that they don't have access to health care and it's not affordable. And exactly to your point, we know folks are skipping out on care uh, because they can't afford it. We've had over 18 rural hospitals close in the last decade in our state, and that is catastrophic for people. Uh, when you are having a health crisis, if you can't get to a doctor's office in a timely way, it, it is truly life and death. I'm very proud of the work that we've done in this space around uh, just, to, just today, the governor uh, allowed to pass through the 340B program which will help with prescription drug costs as governor will continue to expand on these initiatives that we've accomplished. A lot more questions just after this. Stick around. Yeah. Welcome back. Let's do a quick yes or no lightning round. Candidates, for the next few questions, raise your hand to signal yes and keep your hand down for no. Would you commit to allowing Kansas City and St. Louis to control their police departments at the local level? Both say yes. Okay, should President Biden step aside and let another Democrat run? Neither say Both yes. say. Has Congresswoman Cori Bush earned a third term in Congress? Up to the voters. Up to the voters, yeah. Oh. We have a, we have, was that a yes, Mike? It's a tough one. It's up to the voters. And that was a maybe. That okay, was an up to the yeah. voters. Yeah. I don't live in St. Louis. Yeah. <laughs> no, she's not a voter. Uh, will you both commit to releasing your full tax returns before the election? We have one yes there. Uh, All right. Okay. Very good. A little lightning around there. Uh, Ms. Quaid, we'll start with you on these questions. A full 60 seconds for your response. Fentanyl is killing young Missourians at an alarming rate. Recent public health data shows that drug overdose is the leading cause of death among Missouri adults ages 18 to 44. And the DEA tells us most of those deadly drugs come across our southern border with Mexico. Does Missouri have an interest in sending support to secure the border? And what other specific steps would you take to stop fentanyl from killing Missourians in the most productive years of their lives? Yeah, I really appreciate this question, Mark. Um, I, like so many families in Missouri, have had personal loss due to addiction. And I know how many thousands of folks this impacts every single day. And so when we have conversations around the drug crisis in our state, absolutely, uh, we can have the conversation on immigration, and I'm happy to talk about that. But as governor, where my energy will be focused is making sure that we are providing the necessary, necessary resources in our local communities to give folks the tools that they need to be successful in the addiction space. We have so many amazing groups who are working in the, in the addiction space for housing and resources within the community and they do not have enough support and funding so that when folks are suffering from addiction, they have access to get out of this terrible cycle that they're stuck in. And as governor, that's where my focus will be. To answer your question, uh, we absolutely know that the border is a crisis right now and it's top of mind for so many folks. And um, of course, as governor, I will work with our federal delegation to make sure that we're providing the necessary resources. Mr. Haber, how would you solve the fentanyl crisis? So first off, let me just address the border situation. Uh, as governor, I would never send the men and women of the Missouri National Guard down to protect our border. That is a federal issue, and it is up to the federal government to deal with that, not to the people in the state of Missouri. Secondly, uh, with regard to fentanyl, uh, in my plan I propose treatment centers that will support people that are addicted and nonviolent criminals to make sure that we do things to support people here in the state of Missouri, not put dollars somewhere else that aren't supporting people in the state of Missouri. Thank you. Mr. Hamra, academic research from the University of North Carolina found racial variances in Missouri's use of the death penalty. Homicides involving white vic victims were almost seven times more likely to result in executions than homicides involving black victims. And homicides involving white female victims were nearly 14 times more likely to result in executions than those involving victims who were black males. Do you believe systemic racism is present in today's Missouri's criminal justice system, and would you ever allow the state to execute anybody? Well, look, the truth of the matter is, uh, it's the law of this land right now. Uh, as governor, I would absolutely look to the legislator to deal with that issue, but the truth is, most of our, of our legislative body has a supermajority right now. It would be challenging to overturn that. And as governor, I will make sure that we're going to do everything we can to look at each and every individual case that comes before uh, my office. 
Any comments, Ms. Ms. Quaid? Yeah, I appreciate that question, Ruth. Um, when we have the conversation around criminal justice, we absolutely need to be talking about the racial disparities that we're seeing. Not only those stats you mentioned, but if we look at just simply our pullover rates in the state of Missouri, of course, African-American numbers are skyrocketing above white Missourians who are getting pulled over. There is so much work that we need to do in this space. To answer your question around the death penalty, I do not support it, and my record shows that. What I think we need to be doing is having conversations around supporting our jurors who more often than not do not say that folks need the death penalty and our, and our judges are overruling that, and that's a bipartisan bill that we could talk about. Okay. We've got more questions coming up right after this. Ms. Quaid, the average annual cost for two children in a daycare center is roughly double that of one year of public college tuition. And that's only if you can even locate a suitable facility in the first place. Some Republicans running for governor uh, says they shouldn't have to foot the bill for someone else's child care. So why are they wrong? Yeah, uh, again, you know, child care is a huge crisis, and I know that firsthand as a working mom. Um, it's a thing that, that I had to debate, do I even go to work at all, because will I make enough money to survive? And I'll tell you, the very first bill that I filed in Jefferson City had to do with child care, because every single person that I talked to in my district said to me, access to child care that's affordable is keeping me from being successful. I'm really proud of the work that we've been able to accomplish in that space to try to move the needle, um, but more importantly, getting uh, the Republicans and folks on the other side of the aisle to make this a priority. Governor Parson uh, put forward as one of his priorities some tax credits in this space and so really proud that we've been able to move this conversation. But the reality is is that Missourians still are in this crisis where they can't find any help. So we need to have conversations around increasing pay for these workers because we know that they are barely making ends meet, sometimes working extra jobs. We need to have conversations around fully funding the cliff effect subsidy programs um, and we need to have job trainings and we can do incentives. There are so many things that could be addressed in this space beyond just tax credits, um, but this is one that I deeply am passionate about. Thank you. Wish we had more time. We've got more questions here, but we have to start with closing statements with the time we have left. So each candidate will have one minute for their closing statement, and we'll begin with Ms. Quaid. Thank you again so much for having us. Um, you know, as the Democratic leader in the State House for the last almost six years, I have fought so hard for issues that matter most to people, whether it was expanding childcare access or being on the front lines fighting against this draconian abortion ban that we have in our state. Again, as the only wife and mother in this race, I understand firsthand what it means to have politicians in our doctor's offices. I can't tell you how many phone calls I've personally received from women who are going to the doctor's office in active miscarriage and told to be sent home and told to bleed out because you're not close enough to death yet. This is what's at stake here in Missouri. I am so proud of the relationships I've built across the aisle. I am so deeply proud of all of the endorsements that I have in this race, from Planned Parenthood and the other abortion rights groups, to the Sierra Club, to the Missouri AFL-CIO, and there are over 500 million or 500,000 members in our state, our teachers, our electricians, our laborers, and the list goes on. I've built a winning coalition that we know can win in November, and I know we can beat the odds because I've been doing it my whole life. And Mr. Hammer, to you. Yeah, first off, I want to thank everybody for watching the debate. Uh, uh, but extremists, the reality is extremists in Jefferson City have outlawed abortion in the state of Missouri. And we need a governor that's going to fight for women's rights to abortion. Right now, they're also trying to uh, ban uh, birth control. That is something I will not stand for as governor uh, in the state of Missouri. But for the truth of the matter is, I've worked for the last 22 years in supporting people and growing in their careers, supporting them in their life. For example, supporting people who need daycare to unleash their potential to grow in their careers. I know that's going to be a key matter for people in the state of Missouri, but I also know there's much work to be done around the economy and supporting people and struggling families, both around education and about health care. And I'm going to work like hell every single day to make the people's lives of Missouri better. So thank you for the opportunity to be here. Welcome back. Anita Mannion joins us now. She's a political expert with her PhD in political science and was in the studio uh, watching the candidates debate. First reactions, how did it go? Well, first of all, kudos to the moderators and the candidates for a debate that was civil and substantive. That was very refreshing, right, for a change. But overall, I thought we got into some real issues that matter to Democratic voters and that the candidates actually responded directly to those issues. So, um, you know, I, I think this is going to be informative for Missouri voters. 
How do you see the respective candidates' strengths? I think Crystal Quaid was clearly the more experienced politician, and she tried to lean into that, talking about bills that she sponsored, endorsements she has, um, and so that was very clear. I thought that Hamra also did a good job of responding to the issues and referring to a policy um, platform that he recently put out. He didn't get into as much specifics and he doesn't have the background in politics. I would have liked to hear him maybe lean in a little more into his experience, how that connects to the job of governor. Yeah, I think he really wants people to go read his plan. He kept referring to that he plan. He absolutely did, yeah. Uh, he also talked about the fact that even if the constitutional amendment passes, he seemed to suggest there could be a continuing fight to restrict access to birth control or to other things around reproductive rights. How heavy does that weigh on voters' minds, do you think, in a Democratic primary contest? Yeah, I think that, that the, the uh, issues around abortion and reproductive rights are definitely something all Democratic candidates in Missouri are going to be leaning into this year, and a, a very motivating issue for voters. The lightning round was interesting. Some of the, poli <laughs> like the political questions, <laughs> yeah. what stood out to you there? Uh, well, I think the two that they seemed a little hesitant on were those uh, questions about Biden and Bush, right? And you even get a, uh, <laughs> um, I think, from Crystal Quaid. But I thought, I thought those were good questions. That was a, a fun way to see how they stacked up on the issues. I see. In terms of where they sh you think these candidates should focus their attention as they continue to campaign around the state, where do you think they should be focusing? Yeah, I, I think from Hamra, I, I would really like to see, since he doesn't have a policy or political record, he talked about that policy plan, but maybe getting into some more of the specifics. One thing he did do that I liked is so often, whether it's the presidential campaign or the gubernatorial campaign, candidates make all these assertions about what they're going to do, but those are really things the legislature does, and the, the executive doesn't have power of those. And he, he did kind of acknowledge that, what the legislature would need to do and what he could do. So I thought that was useful. With Crystal Quaid, I think she really did try to lean into the fact that she is a, a woman, a, a mother, and uh, her endorsements, and her rural background. You know, she uh, was a little more um, maybe stern about the border issue, calling it a crisis, which could be appealing to more rural voters in Missouri. And she also leaned into being from Springfield, a working class background, the first person in her family to graduate high school. So I think that narrative can hopefully, from her standpoint, help her connect with voters across the state. We heard Mike Hamra really depart from Governor Parson, and there's been some Democrats in Jefferson City support this idea of sending National Guard to the southern border. Yeah. It's been bipartisan. He said, no, that's a federal issue. But outside of that, there wasn't really any moment where either candidate challenged the other one. That's right. they, they really kind of just stayed away from each other. What do you make of that? How do you assess the relationship between the two? We came in prepared to have to like, okay, you two stand apart, go back to your corners, and we didn't get any of it. No, it was very civil. They each sort of said their point, but really didn't engage much with each other. Um, and we're only, you know, less than a month out from the election. So perhaps that's how they're going to play this, uh, keeping it civil, which for a lot of us is refreshing after seeing so much, um, so many debates devolve into those fights. So it was nice to just hear actual answers to your questions. What are your thoughts on what you think voter turnout is gonna be like? That's a great question. Generally in primary elections, it's very low, maybe around 20%. But we have some big races this time and open seats and competitive primaries. Um, you know, some primary races with eight candidates on the ballot. And so I think that uh, folks are really going to try to be whipping up voter turnout. And there'll be some ballot initiatives too, which can also help drive voter turnout. Unlike Illinois, Missouri decouples its primary election for statewide races from the presidential race. Right. In Illinois, it's all for one, you know, you're all out there, so there's a bigger turnout. Here, I wonder how much of an advantage Mike Hammer has because he has deep pockets, he can yeah. fund his own ads, where Crystal Quaid is a different ty type of candidate. She's known among Democratic Party faithful, the activists, the elected officials, the lawmakers. But how do you stack those two up? I mean, they have very different bases of support in how their campaigns are constructed. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, Hammer, while he's campaigning in these next couple of weeks, can really lean into being a business owner and use that to appeal to voters across the state. Um, but it is interesting that Crystal Quaid, to those of us who are really engaged in politics and Missouri politics, she's a known commodity, but I think to most voters, she may not be. So I think both of them are introducing themselves to voters. I'm going to put you on the spot. Oh, shoot. <laughs> who won the debate? Oh, Gosh, I don't like to um, <laughs> really say that, but I'll say 
Crystal Quaid did come across as the more experienced politician. Um, so you take that as you will. <laughs> if, if you're giving notes to Mr. Hammer on how he can improve his performance over the next few weeks until Election Day? I think, like I said, he could lean into his business background and really connect that to policies and what he will do as governor. All right, that's all the time we have. Ruth Izzell and Anita Mannion, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for joining us. And again, don't forget to make a plan to vote August 6th. That's the primary election. We'll see you around.